Hi, welcome to From the Research Chair, episode 10. I am Jason Voss, and my partner is... I am Michael Falk. Today we're going to be talking about strategy, a couple variations on strategy, in fact, the advantages and disadvantages of those variations, and then we're going to do an industry outlook. Should be an interesting discussion. Michael, why are we having this discussion? Well, according to my calendar, Jason, it is the end of October. And for most businesses, or let's just say we would hope for most businesses, this is when they should start thinking about at least the next year, if not further on. Hopefully further on too. Let's not be too short term. Of course. And in addition, uh, we were talking about it in the pre-podcast conversation. Uh, We think a lot of investment firms within their investment process could stand to bring a little bit of an appreciation for strategy, if nothing else, to serve as a check on the BS or signal (laughs) that they receive from the firms that they invest in. Michael, talk to us high level about how you approach strategy. And by the way, we're joined by our colleague, Brian Kozlowski. So, Brian, I I would think any ads you have here would be useful too. But Michael, talk high level. What do you guys do? Well, first of all, we want to process stakeholders, not just shareholders. And we have a real simple formula. Are you ready? CEOs, clients, employees, owners, and if you dare, society. And what we want to do is we want to talk people through those three or four based upon the firm's predilections, where they see potential to raise their game and further the success of their organization in those main categories, because the desires, the wants of the different CEOs, if we split it apart, are not the same. How do you meet their desires? So that's the high level, Jason. That's the high level, no doubt. So take us a little bit uh, further down into your process. What's the framework that you and Brian use as you work with firms? We don't have to give away all the secret sauce, but in terms of how you tend to think about it and help sort it out for folks. Well, in honor that Halloween is just a couple of days away, maybe we should talk about ghosts (laughs) because that is our process. And no, we're not talking about ghosting anybody in the firm. We're talking about G-O-S-T, no H. Goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics. Let me give you an example, if I may. Goal, we wish to grow. General, always the goals should be general and broad. Objectives can be specific definitions of that growth. It could be AUM, it could be profitability, it could be number of differentiated types of clients. You can have multiple objectives. Each of the objectives then, at that point, needs to get strategies. How, strategy is the how. How are you going to achieve that objective? Again, general, general. So let's say you want to increase AUM growth. A general would be better investment performance, right? That might help. Then underneath those strategies, the specific steps, the tactics, the T in ghost. How is it? What are you going to do step by step by step to try and make that strategy come true? So our process is ghost. So let's place this on a time horizon. When you work with firms, what's the sweet spot in terms of thinking about strategy? Is it three months? Is it one year? Is it five years? Is it 70 years? Like We like three years. Uh, We are okay with five years. We don't want it shorter than three. We don't want it longer than five. And what's really interesting, because we start narrow and then go broad, almost like a, a Christmas tree in evergreen, goals to tactics. Okay, the goals and the objectives change glacially for most firms over time, but the strategies and tactics can change much more frequently. So it's not uncommon over a three year plan for all the tactics to be completed, the strategies to be mostly completed, but the objectives and goals may hang around for the next iteration and they have to update the strategies and tactics and they have to actually stretch them in the objectives. How about reflexivity? How, how, how does somebody adapt, right? 
isn't it a mistake to have too chiseled in granite a strategy that is blind or turns a blind eye? Massively. The metaphor I try and sell to every firm we do the work with is sailing, is a sailboat. You're on a pier, you're about to get on a sailboat, you know where you're going to go across the bay right? That would be your vision of success, where you're going. Those would be your goals to a certain extent. But if any, any one of you have ever sailed, or at least you'll understand this, you can plot your straight line to, to that, that spot across the bay. But based upon the winds, oh my, you're going to have to tack back and forth. You're going to have to do different things that you didn't plan on. That's not in the plan necessarily. So, Jason, great connection. There's nothing chiseled. It's on paper. It's usually not more than three to five pages, all completely written out, clearly delineated with individual responsibilities labeled on the tactics. But you have a check-in every month or every quarter to see what maybe needs to be altered. You're tacking in sailing. In a strategic plan, the winds of the market do shift, and you need to be ready to maybe make some amendments in your strategic plan. So talk to us about assigning goals, right? So I'm guessing that when you and Brian do the ghost work within the CEO's framework, you assign responsibility down there in that tactics level. What are some of the things that make for good tactics? What make for good, good achievable things? What are the elements there? Uh, two elements, but it's really less about the elements and more about the people. Uh, the, the reason most strategic plans don't get fully executed or fail, I, I hate to go right to failure, is because people in these, in these jobs have jobs. The strategic plan is something above and beyond. So to, to execute this thing, you really want to get people to put their name next to a tactic volunteers first before any assignments that you want it to be in their area of specialty their area of work their area of interest hopefully and then you've got a much greater chance of it occurring so it's not the goals that get assigned it's the tactics that get assigned all the way at the bottom the individual steps because that's not airy fairy the individual steps are clearly delineated either by a time frame when to get it done or by some sort of an amount, something measurable. And measurable is not listed as a potential gotcha. No, measurable is to inform the same way you would tack back and forth in a sailboat. Where are we relative to where we wanna go? Do we need to make any alterations? So is it your advice, yours or Brian's advice, when working with firms implementing these strategies um, that there be a person who is in the C-suite or at the board level who's responsible for the overall execution of this. And by that, I mean who's secretary, right? They have a list and a roster of what's what and they you know, know to check in with it. Is that, is that true? We've actually given a name to this person. Um, we refer to this person as the strategy czar. Uh, we do want someone who oversees. They don't have responsibility for anything but the overseeing. More specifically, and generally they are in the C-suite, Jason, they have responsibility. They're the only ones allowed to check something off. Oh, that was completed. Or to make an alteration because they need to tack. So there is someone. Uh, they're not reshaping the plan itself. They are the ongoing facilitator and editor. So talk to us about the advantages of this framework. Uh, like why this framework and not another one would be one question, but then in general for strategy and in particular, the, the way most firms do strategy is exactly as you've said. They set a navigational compass point and then they head toward it. If they derivate, they navigate back towards that. What are the advantages of thinking about things this way? It works. All right. No, you probably want more than that. Uh, Why no, does key, it work, Michael? <laughs> the, key, the key is <clears throat> so often strategic plans are done at high level. Maybe it is the C-suite. 
and then it's kind of passed down. We won't use the expression stone tablets, but it's passed down to people in the firm. We actually, in the design of the work, let's take the employee, the, the E and the CEO. A small group of employees are who are the original drafters of the strategies and tactics. They don't have decision rights, but they're original drafters. Then the C-suite is doing editing with our assistants based upon our experience and helping to bring forth the ideas. So our, our process is inclusive down into the organization and then back up for decisions. So you achieve buy-in throughout the process by people through the organization and because they're going to inherit some of the tactics and the responsibility, they're essentially, to some extent, drafting some of their future responsibilities. When you have an employee who actually creates some of their responsibilities, you can bet they're going to get done. So now, the converse. Talk to us about the disadvantages. I know you and Brian have done this with a lot of firms. Sometimes you go back to that firm many years later. Surely there are some recurring issues with this, this format. Talk to us about those. I'd say the two main things that we have experienced over time is there's no strategies are or the person falls away. So there's no central person to track. That's really important. The, the next thing is that the organization has not communicated that those tactics, those are part of your remit. The organization hasn't made the strategic plan part of their day-to-day because -day. in all candor, wow, people are busy in this industry and time is a big deal. Time is short. And if you don't ask them, make them, I hate the making them, but if you don't ask them to take responsibility, it's a lot likely to get, less likely to get done. So those are the two areas, Jason, I'd say are where it has a tendency to, the plan is not fulfilled well. So talk to us about, to what degree is strategy a habit? Right, so you, frequently you and Brian will go into a firm, it's the first time they've thought about strategy since the last time they talked about strategy. There has been drift uh, in the execution of this. Is it fair to say that strategy is a habit and that firms that maybe this is a stretch too far, but I'm gonna throw it out there just for, for discussion's sake, that firms that have the habit of strategy also have the habit of performing well? I'm going to go with yes with an asterisk. Um, and my asterisk is based upon performing well if. So it's a conditional. And that is that their strategy is a good one. And it's not more of the same me too from five, 10 years ago. That they're actually, when they think about where they want to go, their goals, their visions of success, that it's with respect to the current is state of the industry, not the was state or what they wish for, but the is state. And on occasion, well, I've got one gig that Brian and I did together, it's coming to mind. This was a hybrid firm. I'll give you a specific example, investment management and wealth management. So they serve two different constituencies. Their investment management work had become impaired. And they were probably gonna be in the penalty box for about three years before they could really gather assets again. But the wealth management was not. And because they were so strong in their local community and so, had such wonderful relationships and connections, it need not be impaired. Well, in the strategic plan, we challenged, you need to really focus on the wealth management while you're repairing your investment management. And it took them about a year before they called me back and they said, Michael, you were right. Now we're going to do this. <laughs> because they didn't want to. They didn't want to hear that, right? Because the investment management was the big profit driver. And it made sense. But there was a little bit of cognitive dissonance when we started. So the challenge is recognizing the is of what is today 
And not saying that the past is not going to be the future again. We do have cyclicality in this industry, but there's a lot that's changing and we have to be thoughtful about that, which probably leads into the topic of scenario analysis. Well, you read my mind. I was going to start uh, talking about scenario planning, which my- So Jason, tell us about (laughs) scenario planning first, just define it for everyone, just make sure we're all on the same page and then talk about how you think about it of how it can be additive and very beneficial in this work and with investors doing security research. Yeah, and thank you for, for that part. I, I think we'll both return to that subject because I think both of these frameworks are one, complementary, but two, I think you and I have a passion and a belief that firms ought to be doing this more at the research level, not just at the C-suite level to navigate their own firms and their, their direction. So scenario planning is different than typical strategy because strategy typically is based on an assumption that the status quo is going to maintain and go forward. In the investment business, that's been a fairly safe assumption for probably 40 years, right? Since about the mid 70s to the early 80s, how the business has done has been fairly stable. More recently, last five years or so, obviously with the rise of passive investing in ETFs, a lot of active firms are, <clears throat> yes? No use of the word passive. <laughs> They're just indexes. There's nothing passive here. Well, you are correct. That's a whole nother subject. And we've covered that ground before, but most people know it as such. We have not invented a Uh, colloquial term that is widely accepted. So that is my shorthand for those that aren't doing active. In any case, uh, typical strategy work is all within domain, same context. Scenario planning turns that on its head and imagines different possible future outcomes that can be quite different. We're talking about context breaks and trying to imagine which context breaks have a high probability. So I'll give you an example uh, within uh, a business environment Um, A typical strategy would say, look, we're in the business of making widgets. We think next year our widgets are probably going to, uh, growth is going to be 10%. And we have an outperformed scenario. We might grow 12%. We might only grow 8%. We might adjust capital allocations, you know, based on that. And our strategy is basically to sell more widgets. Now, that sounds very familiar, Jason, in the industry. Well, indeed. It absolutely does. So within scenario planning, you might instead ask questions like, what if we experience a supply disruption? Say there's an earthquake in our manufacturing zone within China, and we can't access our raw material. Or what if uh, we have a top heavy customer base and one customer makes up 35%, we might scenario plan what happens if we lose that big customer. So you imagine different narratives that interrupt. And then within that, you construct responses. And so like you and Brian with a framework for strategy, there's also a framework for scenario planning that's very different than uh, it is for uh, the CEO's model that you described. The first thing, and I I love that you said you have to start with like the right people. Scenario planning really requires the right people. And it's been my experience in trying to get firms or helping firms adopt scenario planning as a way of thinking that they make the mistake of having just the C-suite involved, where scenario planning really involves or needs and requires creative people, people who can imagine possible futures. And so in that way, you have to be selective. You need folks who can imagine possible futures, and they're not just blindly mathematically forecasting out in the future or or, um, blindly saying the current status quo plus 10% or something like that. So that's the first thing, you have to have good people. The next is you begin with a survey of predetermined elements in the environment in which you operate. So demographics is a classic example. Sand the meteor strike or a global pandemic that's even worse than COVID, you really are talking about a demographic uh, ship that once it's sailed, there's huge inertia in it. You cannot correct demographics very quickly. Yes, Michael. I love the topic of demographics now. Whether people get deep enough to have good understanding it is the single best long-term potential strategic predictor. Totally agree. Like parenthetically, I'll just insert here. There's been a slowdown in markets post the Great Recession. And one of the factors that I think is happening there that is not widely appreciated by our industry is the Gen Xers are in their peak earning years and the Gen X generation is much smaller than the baby boomers were. 
And so you would expect to see a fall off in the um, amount of savings and, that, that would help drive investment within the economy. But I don't want to digress. I think that's another explanation that's not widely appreciated because people don't appreciate demographics. And there's so much here. And yeah, you want to get into China. Wow, you need to have a deeper understanding of demographics to understand. Then, of course, then we have to maybe add on geopolitics. But that would be scenario planning again, wouldn't almost, it? Yeah, almost there. So with scenario planning, you begin with the predetermined, actually, you begin with the team. Next, what are the predetermined elements? Other predetermined elements are things like huge government spending projects, like the Belt and Road Initiative between China and Russia, unlikely to change anytime soon. There's capital that's being expended there of a gigantic proportion, probably not going to change. Another predetermined element, Michael, to your point about geopolitics, the relationship between Russia and the U.S., China and the U.S., China relative to Russia, Western Europe relative to the U.S., all those geopolitical relationships are pretty fixed. And even with the Trump administration sort of saying we're going to be a little bit more isolationist than we have been for the previous 50 years, a lot of those relationships are pretty rock solid. My prediction would be if the Trump administration either, you know, in several weeks time, it looks like they're going to exit or T plus four years. I bet a president will try and restore those. I think there's probably still good relationship capital, but I digress. So those are predetermined elements. There may be many, but you want to identify those. Those predetermined elements will be present in every scenario that you end up crafting a narrative for. Then what you do is identify uncertain elements. These are things where you don't have high probability of belief, but you think they might be likely to occur. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Like weather? Like, well, no, better than weather. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Weather would be one, but most people don't scenario plan the weather um, because- Maybe maybe they should. Well, yeah, that, that would be, if it's a long-term scenario, sure. Like climate change, I would agree with you. But I'll give you an example of um, a predetermined element or sorry, an uncertain element. Uh, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, there was a growing discord in the big democracies around the world. It manifested as Occupy Wall Street. The question would be, at that time, the Occupy movement, actually, I guess that was longer ago than I'm giving credit for it. That was like nine years ago. Oh my God, the time flies. Anyway, when Occupy Wall Street happened, the question was, is the income disparity between the haves and have not so large that it will lead to social, lead to social revolution of a profound kind, the likes of which happened in the early 20th century in many countries around the world that destroyed a lot of the old monarchies, like in China, for example, like in Europe, for example. Um, unknown, that's an uncertain thing. And if you were scenario planning about possible futures, that would be something that you would identify as an uncertainty. These are things that seem like they're on the horizon as possibilities, but you don't quite know. Next, after you've got your predetermined elements, your uncertain elements, if you mix and match those together, right? So predetermined are the foundational parts, the fixed cost part, if you will. The variable elements, the, pre the uncertain elements combine to create different possible outcomes in the future, which then naturally suggest narratives. And here's where the creativity comes uh, to the fore. If you have a team of say eight people, you would have two people each take a scenario and they're going to author a narrative of things that may occur given these different combinations. Those narratives should be ideally very different. Importantly, one of those scenarios should be the business as usual case, meaning an extrapolation to the future because it serves as the natural contrast within that business as usual scenario. The traditional strategy work that Michael and Brian do would be exactly how you would respond to that. But then here's what makes scenario planning very interesting. Once you've got those different narratives, you then identify leading indicators. So for example, if in fact social strife is going to lead to revolution rather than just inconvenient times for a little while, you would try and identify what would be an indicator that that revolutionary state was happening. Because you're thinking about things in terms of scenarios, chances are you then have baked responses that allow you to move much faster than your competition to things. I'll give you an example within the investment management business. How do we get millennials on board and start saving for their retirement? Well, you could begin to think of a leading indicator that would indicate that they've begun moving out of their parents' houses and they've begun entering their peak year earning years and they're now gonna be big savers. And not only that, but they're gonna be accessors of our products as financial service providers. Final thing, 
you want to rehearse the implications of these things within the C-suite so that as these scenarios unfold, you have an off-the-shelf response that allows you to respond much more quickly. As we all know, because we're investors, frequently businesses who respond to strife faster emerge much stronger on the other side. One final example of how scenario planning is advantageous, that it serves as a great compare and contrast with strategy, is Y2K. Now, most of the people on our podcast today are like Michael and me and Brian with, and Jeff, Jeff, you left your camera on, now you get punished. We all have receding hairlines. We remember what Y2K is. Some of the people today this, may not this, remember what Y2K is. Receded. <laughs> receded, exactly. Not receding. Mar the, the rabbits have marched backwards. The hairs have receded. Um, in any case, um, Y2K was uh, at the turn of the millennia, a belief that computer systems only had two, di two digits built into their systems to store dates rather than four. So instead of two th or 1999, it just said 99. And there was a belief that that would have huge ramifications because software wouldn't understand the rollover into a new millennia or even a new century. So anyway, businesses invested massive amounts in trying to uh, forestall or to predict what would happen if massively systems shut down. Y2K came and went with a whimper. Nothing really happened. If I remember right, there were two incidents globally. One was like Saks Fifth Avenue's credit card network didn't quite function right, but they got it you know, rectified very quickly. From a forecasting standpoint, Y2K was a disaster. But here's how scenario planning has a different conclusion. When September 11th happened just one year later and markets were shut down, the firms like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, they dusted off their Y2K plans, their scenario plans, and they said, the markets are shut down. We know how to respond because we have scenario plans, not necessarily the causal event. Y2K was the causal event. That cause is different, but the effect is the same. Markets are shut down. What do we do? And so they responded within days to what otherwise could have been a very, very difficult situation. But let's give another example, Jason. Dude, so, go. you know, a few years back, there was this thing in Asia called SARS. And the Asian communities learned from that. So in what context now, Michael? <sighs> let's just use one word, masks. All right. Uh, so when COVID came around, they were so quick to adopt more productive behaviors in response to what has become a global pandemic, that they're doing much better than those in the West who never actually had to really deal with SARS. So there's another real life example that my goodness is that current. And there are there myriad examples of businesses that have successfully scenario planned that have almost permanent or generational competitive advantage because when one of those scenarios happens, not only do they see it sooner, they respond faster. One final note, uh, those in the audience may be wondering, well, gee, does that mean I have to do strategy four times as an investor? No, your scenario plan isn't at the same level of depth that a strategy would be for your firm, but you have these narratives in place, especially the leading indicators. You have to put somebody in charge to look for the leading indicators, and that's it. It's, it's broad, but not as deep. Strategy is deep, but narrow. Michael, talk to us about the advantages of thinking like this within the investment team. When you have thoughts about what might be coming, right? It doesn't mean that you, you've nailed it, that you're correct. But when you have thoughts about what might be coming, when it happens, you process, you don't react. That's the simplest way I can put it, Jason. I don't know if that's going to be satisfactory to our listeners, but it's the same idea. You're, you're, walking, you're walking along a street and somebody jumps out from an alley and says, boo, in honor of Halloween, right? And somebody, you jump, right? However, if you knew that there was a likelihood or a possibility of somebody jumping out from that alley and saying, boo, you probably wouldn't have jumped. Your skin might not have crawled. You may not have. It gives you the ability to process instead of react. And in the business world, oh my, oh my, 
Think of businesses when we started getting shut down because of COVID, right? And they're scrambling like mad. Their ops people, the operations, the tech people, most important people in the organization for a month, maybe longer, because they had to make sure everybody had access, everybody was up and running, everything was working. These folks were critical, they still are, but they're not front of mind as much anymore. But do you know what you need to provide to these people given a circumstance like that? How about more support? How about more resources? How about more patience because of what they were just affected by? Uh, you know, 12 hour work days, six days a week because they have to support the entire organization getting through the COVID lockdown. So those are a couple examples that I would just give that I think are very timely and respectful. Yeah, and I'll, I'll offer up slightly different ones. And that is, I was a PM, a fundamental PM, bottom-up PM, value-sensitive value kind of a guy. And nonetheless, I did scenario planning because a macro perspective was valuable and informed which companies or which industries to look at. I'll give you an example. Um, I have, as a love, geopolitics. I've written about geopolitics. Michael, I know you share that love as well for geopolitics. And when uh, George W. Bush became president, or actually before he became president, they were talking about uh, the Republican Party and those who were supporting his, his bid for the presidency about upping military spending and having a more aggressive posture internationally. And when Bush was in fact elected, he hired into his cabinet a number of secretaries and assistant secretaries from this thing called the Project for the New American Century, who had issued a document called the American Century, which was for them the 21st century. And they laid bare what their plans would be geopolitically. And so as a part of my scenario plan, I read the document and I thought, oh my goodness, they're gonna be much more aggressive in terms of their foreign policy. My prediction is this will create friction internationally with places that are already unstable and so what will probably perform well are companies that have to do with airport security. I thought that the firearms manufacturers might do better, et cetera, et cetera. I ended up buying uh, shares of a company called Envision Technologies, which makes a lot of airport scanners. And when September 11th happened, which was, again, scenario planning doesn't require you forecast the event. You just have a plan for what may happen when September 11th happened. And you could argue that its machinations predated Bush, but nonetheless, when it happened, I already had in place a higher security company uh, posture within my portfolio. And Vision Technologies went up 40% whenever it was that the markets opened after September 11th. Mm -hmm. GE ended up buying Envision Technologies and took away my pure play uh, investment, damn it. And then I had shares in GE, which I didn't want. Um, but nonetheless, that's an example <laughs> of how it can, can serve you well as an investor. Um, uh, Michael, why, why don't firms like to think this way? Do you have any perspective? Uh, I, it, it puzzles me why more of this isn't done. I think it goes back to the legendary work by Clayton Christensen from Harvard, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. When you, be, when you reach a certain level of success and you're just producing very, very well, whether you were lucky or good, I don't care, but you've become very successful. To shift at that point in time, to change what you're doing, even if it's just a piece of the organization, is extraordinarily difficult behaviorally. It's some part complacency, like we're successful, why do we want to take any risk? Or if we take this risk, what is the market? What are our clients going to perceive? Jason, you and I hear this a lot when we do our deep investment work. We talk to an investment team and we talk about maybe shifting or evolving one of their investment processes. And their almost knee-jerk reaction is, our clients won't like that. To which you and I are responding, but if it produces more alpha, you're saying... You don't want to take that risk. It's the innovator's dilemma, I think, in, all, in spades, Jason. I hope that helps. Yeah, I think that that's 
probably 60, to me, 60, 65% of that. I think the remainder has a heavy tilt towards just ignorance, right? And it's not willfully ignorant. It's just that business schools don't teach uh, scenario planning at all. In fact, I had to teach myself it. And the reason I did it or learned about it was because of my love of geopolitics, because militaries do it. So I think that that's one is people just don't know anything about it. You just gave me a, a formula, Jason, and you and I love formulas. Complacency, also known as success, plus ignorance equals existential risk. Or equals beta. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying beta and existential risk are the same thing? Uh, no, I'm saying that the, the net result on your portfolio is beta. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. No alpha potential. Yes. Yeah, no yes. alpha potential. So we also promised our audience today that we would discuss a forecast of 2021 for where the industry is uh, possibly headed. Michael, uh, I'll turn it over to you first. This is probably going to be more of a discussion um, than, than anything. Well, you know... You know what they say about forecasting? If you're going to endeavor as to do that, say the thing and not the time or the time and not the thing. <laughs> so you already stated the time, 2021. So I hate you for that. Yes. All right. Uh, <laughs> reject, here's, here's, reject the, the context. So reject the frame. Let's come back to that disgusting word that you used before, passive. And I do mean disgusting. Why? Because it's a misinformation campaign. There's nothing passive about what happens. The indexes are not constructed passively. There's a formula or there's a committee that builds them. Uh, people don't put 100% of their money in one index. Well, by the way, that would be a decision, not passive. People usually build a portfolio of indexes or maybe individual securities. That's not passive, even if all the constituents are believed to be passive, which would be wrong. So what I'm hoping for 2021, this is a hope, not a forecast, is we, we actually get rid of this insidious word. Now, what do I think is going to happen? I happen to I, what I believe is gonna happen is people are going to demand clients, the C and CEOs, clients are gonna demand, if we're gonna pay you fees, that is because you're gonna help us choose our betas or you are going to attempt to produce alpha. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you're an active manager, put into place processes and capacity restrictions and where you fish for ideas and, and purchases, take a shot at producing alpha. Closet indexers are gonna disappear uh, and they should. All right. Now, for the active management about allocating among betas, wealth management, folks, this is never going away. There's a lot of money in the world and it needs to be managed, whether it be actively among betas or a combination of betas and real alpha managers. The industry is going to be bifurcated, trifurcated. Ooh real alpha potential managers, because they're managing that way, pure beta products, and then allocators. And the allocators could use, we're gonna get deeper and deeper clarity in 2021 that you have to fit into one of those three camps. Anything in between, not a good business model. Yeah, it's for on the record, I, Michael, I you know, I'm on the I, I am in agreement with you about passive not being passive. In fact, I have an article called Passive Investing Isn't, and I did exactly what you just did. I took the investment committee at S&P, who determines the S&P 500 as well as the 600 and the 400, and looked at their criteria and then talked about why that would be good criteria as an investor. Um, yeah, it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, se separately, uh, you know, I, I like analogies, I, I think of the indices like the Russell 2000, like the S&P, like the Dow, as the celebrities of the industry. And just like celebrities themselves have a vast media corpus to support them, and because they're famous, 
guess what? Money gets directed their way specifically because they're famous. And I think of the ET, the big ETFs and the big indices. Those are people. known as influencers in social media. Yeah, and I think I think of the momentum effects that are embedded in some of those indices. Anyway, I digress. <gasps> Not momentum, survivorship bias. There's that too, right? Just like yeah. Tom Cruise still makes more money than some of the newer actors. Um, in any case, <laughs> I didn't want to take it there necessarily, but I, I agree but with you. But you did. I, I actually prepared for this portion of our podcast slightly differently. Um, the way I thought about this issue was what's likely to happen in terms of asset flows. And maybe it's because of my scenario influence, uh, scenario planning as a preference influencing my thinking. I think the effects of COVID are still going to be with us in 2021. I think oh, that, 2022 possibly as well. Yeah, t totally agree. The people who think this is going to be over in months, I, I, I'm so sorry, you're yeah, wrong. To totally agree. And I think that a lot of the economic fallout from it is not baked in to economic numbers, including GDP and unemployment. And that's, that's globally, not just here in the US. And I would imagine that we're gonna to start to see skipped car payments, which we already are, rent uh, non-payments, evictions, mortgage defaults, uh, all of that for us as an industry, since so far the asset management business, uh, thankfully has been relatively untouched, honestly, by COVID. Um, I think that's going to change in 2021. I would imagine. Oh, you wanted to go this way. I'm so sorry. There are two there's, things. Two there's things. No sorrow. There's no two sorrow. things I'm going to throw for fodder. Uh, number one, uh, deflation. Number two, uh, changed fee structures for active managers. And yeah. let me come and, back to you. Let me come back to you. Yeah. Okay. I, it's. I think it's cool that we planned it differently. Yeah, I think it's totally cool that we planned it differently. For the audience, that's a little bit richer, probably. Well, I think our audience actually listens to us because they never know really what's going to happen. Hey, guess what? That includes Jason and me, too. <laughs> well, we do do some planning. A um, little bit, yeah. So anyway, I think what's going to happen is our business, which has been relatively unscathed, we're going to start to see withdrawals because one of the ways that people will bridge the divide is they will start to tap their retirement accounts Savings has probably, in, for many families, already been tapped. And they will forego the early withdrawal penalties. They'll start to make withdrawals. They'll stop contributing, perhaps, to retirement plans if they're still employed. If a spouse within the household has lost their job, they'll stop their contributions. All of that, to me, looks like assets under management have pressure on them to the upside. Um, and I think that any carefully thinking asset management firm ought to be thinking about those kinds of possibilities. Michael, I agree with you on deflation, but you said it first. Talk first about it. Well, there are a few main inputs to deflation. Let's just understand what causes it. Um, agedness, and that's a demographic topic. Technology, oh my, we're leveraging it unlike ever before because of COVID, the Zoom world. Uh, globalization, yeah, we've got some challenges, but we're, that genie is not going back in the bottle. Uh, and interest rates. Low interest rates beget low or lower interest rates. You know what's really interesting, Jason, and you and I have talked about this, but I don't know if our listeners have thought about this. If we track U.S. interest rates going back 150 years, all right, but for bell bottoms, and the stagflation era of the 1970s, I just had to add some color with bell bottoms. Why? Let's never go back there. Uh, the 1970s, if you take the 1970s roughly, I'm giving you rough, 10 years out of the 150, we don't have, we really don't have inflation almost ever greater than 3% per year. That's my line of demarcation. And you go back historically, deflation is the global historical norm. Inflation is the anomaly. And we've really only seen it for 10 out of the 150 years in the US. Yeah, Michael, you and I have a client, of course, where that's a, that's a tough one for them because they look at that long swath, but they haven't bothered to look at the causal forces that cause the variation in, in interest rates. You and I have done that work. 
And if you subtract that out, it's exactly as Michael says. You see basically a risk-free rate, quote unquote risk-free. That's another misnomer that I hope would end. Uh, There's nothing risk-free. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in any case, the, it's about 3.3, you know, up until like the 1930s. Now it's about 2.8 in the current era. It's obviously lower than that now, but it's just a slow march downward. And of interest rates, that's different than inflation, but yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah those two kind of trap. Um, they, well, they should, shouldn't they? Exactly our point. Um, well, so hey, you know, money is a medium, right? Money is to help make things happen in an economy, right? So isn't it arguable that as an economy gets more efficient? Well, more, exactly. And more that, inclusive, the cost of money should go down? Well, of course, right? If nothing else, the information uh, costs of discovery and due diligence are permanently lower because of the internet and data uh, is profligate, uh, including weird data. But to that point, Michael. <laughs> Does that mean we won a prize? Is that you, Michael? Are you responsible for that? I don't think so. <laughs> um, I'm trying to get a point across which is one of the most interesting pieces of data I have seen. Oh, hold on. No, I think that may be our closing music. It's like we won an Oscar, Jason, and trying to get us off the stage. I have no idea. Um, let me get this data out because I think the audience will find it fascinating. And I, I wish I could give it to you, but I saw it in a conference put up by Rick Reeder of BlackRock, or Rick Ryder, I don't remember how you pronounce his last name. And he put up a chart of work that BlackRock had done that showed that uh, the traditional inflation story, right, 1.8-ish percent over the last, like, 15 years. But he put up the unit inflation that is present, meaning the output per unit is much, much higher. It's like 8% globally. And so if you have inflation of 1.8%, but unit inflation is 8%, meaning output per unit is up, that means there's massive deflation that's not appreciated because inflation is a price phenomenon, not a unit phenomenon. And I think that, that that's only going to continue to go down, even in the COVID era. If anything, I think they're accelerating forces and causing pressure there. So I agree with you, Michael. Yeah. And, you know, maybe we've all seen this. I can't help myself. People who know me know this. Uh, maybe we've seen this in households. We really haven't had a shortage of toilet paper. Yet people continuously, at least in the U.S., we have some international listeners, so you can joke about us. Um, people in the U.S. are hoarding toilet paper, but we have no shortage. So why are you hoarding toilet paper? Yes, I know if you run out of toilet paper at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But yeah, deflation. Yeah. So we're just about at the end of our conversation. Do you have any closing remarks? And if not, I can wrap us up. Well, since I just talked about toilet paper, is that not the end in and of itself? <laughs> Are we about to? No, I can't go there. No, um, no. <laughs> so uh, for those of you in the audience, thank you so much for listening. Our next podcast, yes. those of you, we saw some of uh, you for the first time today on the call. Thanks for joining. We do this every other week on Thursdays, always at the same time, noon Eastern here in the U.S., which means by my reckoning, is that the 10th of October, 12th of October? is our next one topic undecided go to our november YouTube. november yes thank you november the 12th go to our youtube page all of these podcasts are there they usually appear eh, today it'll be several hours thank you brian <laughs> 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 they they usually are up uh within an hour after we finish the podcasts live today will be an exception because i have some consulting work to turn to but thanks so much subscribe to us we really appreciate you listening michael well, I, first of all, it's a pleasure. Thank you for anybody who's willing to listen to us pontificate and elaborate every other week. If you have questions, please send them to us, email, put them in the chat. Perfectly fine. Uh, we will answer them. Uh, as Jason and I have talked about in prior episodes, we're citizens first, investment professionals second. So we would love to interact with you to the extent you welcome it. And it's really as simple to thank you. Hope you keep listening. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.